Volkswagen. It's been called the most recognizable brand name, maybe even the most recognizable shape in the world. Well, it's not hard to see why. Hi, I'm Jack Dalby. The Volkswagen Beetle with its putt-putt motor in the back, its utilitarian interior and its bug-like headlights has been built in more countries in larger quantities for more years than any other car in human history. 21 million Beetles have rolled down the world's highways and byways during the 50s and 60s. Just the name Volkswagen became a synonym for quality and reliability that anyone could afford. Though Volkswagen is the world's fourth largest car company and a big success in other parts of the world, it hasn't always enjoyed world-class success in America. Oh yes, in the golden age of the 50s and 60s, the Beetle was America's leading imported car. But more recent times were troubling for the company. Its philosophy of building an honest, simple car at an honest price ran up against the growing appeal of Japanese cars, which offered more frills and flashier looks and were even cheaper to buy. As a result, Volkswagen sales declined from a peak of 560,000 cars in 1970 to less than a fifth that number in the early 90s. But now, after 20 years of struggle, Volkswagen seems to have been revitalized here in America. They're back with a new range of cars that are surprising bargains by contemporary standards, yet aren't the plain Jane VWs of the past. In fact, they look as sleek and competently Germanic as anything in a Mercedes-Benz or BMW showroom. And in the future, back with, believe it or not, a new Volkswagen that evokes the feeling of the Beetle. A car that will mix the shape of the original lovable bug with the technology of today. How did Volkswagen become the world's best known car, then lose its way in America, and now find its way again? A fascinating story, as we'll see in this episode of In Our Time. German engineering and a new Volkswagen, there's one advance not found on any other car. A device small enough to fit in the palm of your hand, but big enough to change the next 10 years of your life. It's a warranty, the longest limited powertrain warranty in the world. One part of Volkswagen Protection Plus. It's sort of like having headlights that see all the way into the future. in our time continues. What the Model T was to America, the force that mobilized us, brought us together, put us on wheels, the Volkswagen was to Europe and many other parts of the world. Where did the Beetle come from? <laughs> the story begins 60 years ago. Back in the 30s, remember that Europe had no affordable automotive transportation. Driving was a luxury for the rich. In America, cars were already rolling off mass production assembly lines, but in much of the rest of the world, small, low-volume luxury car companies dominated automaking. Motoring for the masses was literally a foreign term. Into this void stepped an extraordinary man, a gruff, quarrelsome man, self-taught, and quick to offer an opinion. Not an altogether likable man, but he was also perhaps the most brilliant and prolific automotive designer of all time. His name was Ferdinand Porsche. Ferdinand Porsche really tried to approach a people's car, since he did the first Volkswagen, the Beetle, uh, from really a technology standpoint on the vehicle itself. He strove for absolute simplicity of design, kept one model and built it in large volume. When you look at what Henry Ford did, it was very similar. A very simple model that could be mass produced. Porsche's creations? Everything from supercharged Mercedes sports cars to the first successful mid-engine race cars to the first of the Porsche roadsters that still bear his name. Undeniably, though, his most enduring legacy was the tough economical design that became 
the Volkswagen Beetle. His plan was to build a car with a small flat engine, to put the engine and transmission together at the rear of the car, and to cool the motor with a stream of air, much as a motorcycle's engine is cooled. But Dr. Porsche soon realized that only a massive, well-financed manufacturing effort could make such a car affordable. So, in 1934, he proposed his idea to the German government, calling the prototype the Volkswagen, or the people's car. And in 1936, the first Volkswagen Beetle was born. The Beetle was the high point of Dr. Uh, Ferdinand Porsche's life, I believe. It was simple, it was economical, and it was designed so everyone could afford it, everyone could maintain it themselves if they were, you know, at least somewhat automotive uh, inclined, mechanically inclined. And it was so well uh, accepted by the masses due to its simplicity and its economics. It, it would run forever and it would never let you down if you gave it the least bait, bit maintenance. Yet it wasn't a cheaply built car. Every one of Dr. Porsche's prototypes passed a rigorous government supervised 30,000 mile endurance test. With huge government support, the foundation stone for a production facility to build Porsche's dream car was laid near the small town of Fallersleben in the area of Saxony two years later. Then, war interrupted the realization of Porsche's dream. Allied pilots bombed the Volkswagen factory several times. At the war's end, a British Army major named Ivan Hurst, a man with a talent for industrial planning, was assigned the task of cleaning up the wrecked factory. He gathered the workers that were still in the area and put together a crew, and they actually uh, got the factory back online. A devastated Europe hungrily snapped up the first Beatles. Porsche's dream was back on track. At the beginning of 1948, the 20,000th Beetle rode off the production line. By 1949, the British turned ownership of the now bustling plant back over to the federal German government. A half million Beetles had been produced by 1953. Only two years later, Volkswagen celebrated the millionth car rolling off the assembly line. Here in America, the Beetle was first shown to a wary viewing public in 1949. By the early 60s, the United States was on its way to becoming the Beetle's greatest export market. In a time of excess, the Beetle was the exact antithesis of what America was building. Simple, compact, frugal, and honest. Unlike Detroit's extravagant dreammobiles, the Beetle was short on chrome and devoid of tail fins. It was unlike anything else on the American road. It was far less costly than anything else, too. And it had this incredible robustness to it. You put it out in the snow, and because it had all the traction on the rear wheels, zip, it would just go with no problem. You could have it out in the desert, and it would never overheat. There was nothing to overheat. There was no radiator in the car. The strong, simple design of the Beetle was echoed by a simple, understated, yet powerful style of advertising. Even 30 years later, many of us remember ads with simple headlines like Lemon, Think Small, and my favorite, Ugly is Only Skin Deep. But the Beetle wasn't just one of America's most popular cars. It was also a component of diverse lifestyles. The Beetle became the chosen car of rambunctious college kids and the preferred transportation for the flower power generation of the 60s. Of course, the unchanging shape of the Beetle concealed ongoing improvements throughout its production run. Continuous testing toughened its chassis, and strenuous quality control made it so airtight that you had to crack open a window to close the doors. The earliest, most collectible Beetles had small split rear windows, but as the car matured, vision out of the back window improved. Other than that, Beetles looked virtually unchanged for almost 60 years. Here, in the company's museum, an early 1938 model sits in a row next to a Beetle built 50 years and 20 million cars later. They appear nearly identical. In our time, we'll return. To a seven-year-old, velocity doesn't mean much. Boy. The equations that surround mass and momentum aren't as much fun as the song on the radio and crash test dummies don't go on family vacations. But the people who buy Volkswagen Jettas do. 
That's why our engineers designed the new Jetta with dual airbags, front and rear crumple zones, side impact beams, and a rigid passenger safety cage. Velocity, mass, and momentum don't mean much to children, and we plan on keeping it that way. In our time continues. The startling successes of Volkswagen in North America did not go unnoticed. Across another ocean, Japanese car makers saw an opportunity in the small car category the Beetle had created. And beginning in the mid-60s, the major automakers of Japan responded with low-cost small cars that vied with the Beetle for the affections of cost-conscious Americans. But the design philosophy of Japanese cars was different. The demanding German market prized durability, a simple, honest design and high-quality materials more than a low price. When you get into just about any German car, you couldn't be in just about anything else. I mean, it's almost a cliche, but when you shut the door, it feels more solid than virtually any other car that you can get into. And the German Autobahns, which often have no speed limit, made high-speed handling and road holding a key need. One of the main uh, requirements of a German car is that it be able to survive at Autobahn speeds. Now, an Autobahn speed for a Volkswagen is obviously not the 150 miles an hour that uh, Mercedes must uh, achieve. But nonetheless, uh, a German driver expects a Volkswagen to survive at full throttle for many, 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 many hours. That's part of the way a German car is built. Um, and that kind of necessity has, has produced a, a level of technology that uh, not many other companies can match. By contrast, Japanese cars tended to be more market-driven. They were constructed to meet a price and to provide obvious features that appealed to the mass buyer. One of the things that stood out with that first Volkswagen, that 1956 that I bought, was that when I got into it the first time to drive it, everything about it, all of the surfaces on the inside, inside the trunk, inside the engine compartment, were covered in beautiful paint. Uh, it was the most thoroughly sealed and finished car that I had ever seen to that date. And I'd seen lots and lots of American cars. I was a car nut. I'd never seen anything like that. Through the late 60s and early 70s, Japanese manufacturers plied their craft, patiently improving upon their troubled early cars. In America, the stage was set for a confrontation between the European concept of an automobile versus the Far Eastern one. The turning point was 1974. The oil embargo and the first energy crisis precipitated a rush to buy economical imported cars. Lowered national speed limits put a premium on style rather than performance. The available Japanese cars were styled and designed like flashy miniatures of American models. They quickly took advantage of demand. Meanwhile, at Volkswagen showrooms, the Beetle was being supplanted by a new range of very different and very European Volkswagen models, the Rabbit, Dasher, and Scirocco. These new cars were, once again, designed for practicality and ruggedness and they improved on the Beetle with roomy cargo space, front wheel drive, and a new range of peppy engines. But their outside styling was characteristically European, too square and too plain to our eyes. And by American standards, their interiors were distinctly less fancy than most competitors. And just as troubling to American buyers, they simply weren't the traditional and much loved Volkswagen Beetle. Whereas the old Beetle looked like nothing else on the road, though the Rabbit was really the leader of its class in going front wheel drive with the box shape, pretty soon everybody caught up, literally within a matter of two years or so. Just about, uh, well, I wouldn't say everybody, but certainly the Japanese and a number of others were right there on top of it, and they were price competitive. And Volkswagen no longer had that unique panache about its car that it had enjoyed with the, the Beetle. The Rabbit and its front-wheel drive descendants sold well in Europe, and they pioneered the concept of the Econobox, a squarish, roomy car with a hatchback that served many needs at low cost. But despite all this, in the United States, the Rabbit and its offspring didn't quite equal the sales and peak years of the Beetle. There were some Volkswagen successes, such as the Pocket Rocket GTI, a sporty hatchback, 
and the Jetta sedan. But gradually, the Japanese car makers overtook Volkswagen in U.S. sales. Through a combination of aggressive pricing and models that emulated VW's economical basic design. Well, I think the Japanese and the other importers decided to copy what Volkswagen made famous in an expensive, uh, beginner economy car that was actually usable and lasted for a long time. And people just started to change and adapt this design and that design, and it all basically revolved around the simple Volkswagen idea. Despite being Europe's biggest car maker and one of Asia's biggest importers of cars, Volkswagen had lost its way in America. In our time, we'll return. The new Volkswagen Golf features a track-correcting rear axle and an improved turning radius of just 32 and a half feet, all of which makes the tight-handling Golf the perfect car for the city. Because many places in the world come with crowbars as standard equipment, the new Volkswagen Jetta comes with an anti-theft alarm system as standard equipment, too. In Our Time continues. From the ashes of World War, Volkswagen had become a success story in America and throughout the world based on the appeal of its remarkable Beetle. Then, somehow, Volkswagen had lost ground in America, despite huge successes elsewhere. Cheaper Japanese cars that focused on consumer wants rather than engineering needs caught the fancy of American buyers, and sales of VWs declined. Until the early 90s, which has brought a remarkable reinvigoration of VW, driven by a combination of factors. For one thing, what Volkswagen consistently provided, a distinctively European driving character, has now become what American buyers want. And the functional styling and the basic honesty of European cars has become the norm in the United States. Oh, there are some ways that the European design has come to, to dominate, really, uh, what uh, American and, and Asian manufacturers are doing. Uh, but I think, and that's in the rounding, obviously, of the edges. Uh, the idea that you can get more space into a smaller package, your more usable interior space than, you know, the you know, big three ever dreamed about, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. The American cars definitely have come much closer to European cars than have European cars come to American ones. Simultaneously, a social revolution in Asia has created demand for better wages and less work time. As a result, Japanese cars have ceased to be inexpensive. Well, the Asians have, have obviously become much more expensive over the last few years, the Japanese, you know, particularly, um, in large part because the yen appreciated compared to all the other currencies, but also because other manufacturers in Europe and you know, America caught up with the manufacturing developments that the uh, Japanese had made. Finally, and most significantly, Volkswagen has continued to build cars that embody the company's core principles of durability and constructional quality. But it has also begun to focus more on the little features that Americans insist on. Everything from better stereo systems, to more elegant interiors, to cup holders. As a result, in 1994, VW U.S. sales reached nearly 100,000 cars, the highest volume in years. VW's worldwide sales rose to 3.3 million, up 6%. The Volkswagen phenomenon appears to be firmly back on track in the USA. VW is definitely coming back in America. I think uh, if you just look at this year, we've doubled sales, and um, it's, that's very significant and we're all very excited about that. And the reason we've doubled sales is because we have great products out there and they're meeting consumer needs. Well, I don't think there's any question VW's coming back. Um, their sales, the last I saw in 1994, their sales were up over 120% compared to uh, a year before. The cars that have put Volkswagen back on American shopping lists generally don't look like the Volkswagens of old. For one thing, they're bigger. No longer can you think small. 
even with Volkswagen's most compact sedan, the Jetta 3, because it has a combined trunk and interior space that's actually larger than a Mercedes C-Class sedan. And other Volkswagen models are equally spacious. For instance, in the Passat, you could call them medium-sized cars. They're not small by any means. They're relatively large, relatively comfortable, quite comfortable. Um, and when you put a car like a Passat next to something like a BMW 5, BMW 5 is bigger, but not much. And yet, we don't think of those in the same context. Another factor. Most current Volkswagens don't have the lovably homely looks of the Beetle. The Jetta 3 sedan and its larger, luxurious sister, the Passat, have the same wind-chiseled styling and sleek functionality of an Infiniti or a Lexus at a much lower price. Still another contrast is in power. The original Beetle featured a 36-horsepower engine. This year's Passat sedan and wagon and Jetta 3, as well as the new GTI Sports Coupe, are all offered with muscular 172 horsepower V6 engines that have become favorites among car buff riders. We tested a Golf fitted with a VR6 engine, and it was a wonderful car. Uh, I don't think there was anyone who drove it who didn't enjoy it immensely. Uh, the, the Golf has always been an enjoyable car to drive, but uh, the VR6 just puts it into really a different category from where we've considered it before. And a final virtue is the versatility of the car. Today's Golf 3 has a cavernous hatchback, a fold-down rear seat, and room for five. It swallows up Pullman cases and sips fuel sparingly, much like the economical Beetle of yesteryear. Of course, some things about a Volkswagen haven't changed as much. One is the price, or more accurately, price relative to what other cars offer. Though it's a far cry from the $1,295 Beetles of the 60s, today's Passat GLX offers a V6 engine, room for five, dual airbags, an eight-speaker stereo system, and even such high-tech features as ABS and traction control, all bolted together by those sturdy old German Meister craftsmen for about $21,000. And this four-cylinder Jetta 3 costs about the same as a Toyota Corolla LE. Another thing that hasn't changed is safety. Long before safety was an issue, Beetles were noted for an exceptional toughness. And current Volkswagens featured dual airbags, safety cell construction, and side impact protection that meets 1997 federal standards. In fact, Prevention Magazine selected a Volkswagen for its Import Safe Car Award in 1992. In safety studies, such as these by the Highway Law Data Institute, Recent model Volkswagens have been rated up to 37% safer than the average small car analyzed. The Volkswagen organization maintains some of Europe's largest crash testing and proving grounds facilities and actually conducts hundreds of crash tests per year. Well, the European contribution to automotive safety is that they invented it. The European way of uh, viewing automotive safety as an obligation of the builder has spread across the market. Everybody uh, realizes that that is essential if you're going to maintain a good reputation with the buyers. Yet another factor is durability. The company now provides a 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty on every new VW model. There's no question that uh, when a manufacturer offers a warranty as long as 10 years, it does strike a note in people's minds uh, that nobody wants to use a warranty but I think most people assume that if a manufacturer is willing to offer that long a warranty that the manufacturer itself is pretty confident that they're not going to need to you know, spend much money on it and that means that uh, the customer won't have to spend a lot of time taking cars to and from the shop. One other thing that hasn't changed is the company's willingness to build specialty models. Yes, you can still buy a Volkswagen convertible. It's called a cabrio for those sunny drives to the beach. Or a Volkswagen camper for that weekend at Yellowstone. The one new Volkswagen that does look like a Beetle is this one. Though right now, you can't buy one.
It's called the Concept One, and as the name suggests, it's a concept prototype used to show the shape to Americans while production cars are prepared. Both hardtop and convertible versions have turned up by turnstiles at the auto shows, and thus far, it's been a huge hit with crowds at the shows. Volkswagen developed the Concept One and has now slated it for production because it was really interested in capturing two very important elements of the company. One is the nostalgia of the Beetle, of that warm, fuzzy feeling that when you mention the word Beetle, people just smile. And combine that with the other part that we're very proud of, and that's the engineering, and have a car that has the latest technology, the most advanced technology, and combine those two into a vehicle, hence Concept One. When the final production version makes its debut, Underneath this familiar skin will be the heart and soul of a contemporary car. When it becomes available in just a few years, this new vehicle, whatever its final name, is expected to have a fuel-injected engine, front-wheel drive, anti-lock brakes, modern safety equipment, including airbags, and even air conditioning. I've seen the Concept One at auto shows in Detroit, Switzerland, and France, and everybody loves it. Um, the, when they first unveiled it at the uh, show here in Detroit, people had been told that there would be something you know, very interesting out on the Volkswagen stand and that it would be a breakthrough. But none of us really expected it because Volkswagen doesn't show that kind of thing. And you don't really think of Volkswagen as being a company that does stylistic breakthroughs. But then they took the, you know, the curtain off and uh, there was the Concept One and everybody was in love with it. Let's do a 1990s version of the Beetle. And voila, they put it out there and people just flip over it. And again, it wasn't people who were just being nostalgic, nostalgic about the 1960s or whatever. A lot of people who really did not grow up with the VW Beetle fell in love with this car. Again, because it has all the wonderful attributes that the original Beetle did. It doesn't look like anything out there. It's got this great styling to it. It's not just a slab-sided box. It's got great curves and shape and proportion to it. So you can see yourself driving in that car and having people look at you and being proud of owning a car like that. The story of Volkswagen's rise, fall, and rebirth is an extraordinary one. And it raises the question, where to now? with his most recognizable of car names. It appears that Volkswagen is headed both into a new future, with new cars and a new, more customer-focused way of doing business, and back to its roots, with an orientation toward value and honesty that recall those beloved early Beatles. In 10 years, perhaps, we'll take another look at Volkswagen. I'm Jack Dalby, for In Our Time.